Hi, I'm Rackernick. And I'm D-Respect. And we're going to be talking about the new All Eyes on Me Tupac biopic. And we're going to talk about what we like about it, what we don't like about it. We're going to give you a quick spoiler-free review, and then we're going to go into the specifics right afterwards. So if you just want to hear what we have to say really quick, and then just click off if you don't want to be spoiled. Uh, or if you want to keep going and hear what we have to say about the movie, don't care. Or if you've already seen it and want to hear what we have to say about it, then watch on. So, uh, going into it, watching it the first time, you know, I was really thinking to myself, like, do I know too much about Pac to like this movie? <laughs> because, uh, now, the first, like, 30 minutes of it felt really solid. It felt, uh, really felt like it was giving us a lot about the backstory of Tupac, um, where he was born, uh, the black activism that was, like, just in his family. Uh, Feeney Shakur, the person who played her, was a great actress. I thought, I thought she really represented the revolutionary um, just feel and, and the backstory of where Tupac came from. Um, unfortunately, I felt like I didn't see the manifestation of all of that, you know, black power stuff, all of the, the, the ideals, the challenging, the norms. I felt like I didn't really see that manifesting in the second half of the movie, the way it was building up in the first half. So... Uh, whereas the first half is giving you sort of like, oh, that's cool, that's where he got this from, that's where this came from. It felt like the second half was like, okay, it felt like it was just hitting story beats instead of really giving us a meaty story that's, uh, that's giving you Tupac's life, that's giving you the reflection of his music into this film and how his life re reflects his art and whatnot. So, ultimately, first third of the film was good. Second two thirds really started to peter out and sort of just like fall back into, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then he suddenly died, <laughs> and, and that's it. So um, overall, mm, serviceable, I guess. If you don't know much about Tupac, I guess it's a it's a cool movie. But if you if you kind of know him, like not and not like you don't have to like know everything about him. Like I don't know everything about him, but like if you know a bit about him, if you've seen a uh, if you've seen a documentary or two, you know, this movie's not gonna really give you the humanity that you're really looking for, so, I give it a, maybe like a 5 out of 10, I don't know, that, that's what I'd say. What, what are Already with a score? Uh, uh, well, this is the spoiler free. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, well, what I thought going into it, um, I pretty much knew that it's very difficult to make a movie about Tupac. Because the cliche thing that you say about Pac is Pac is a thousand different things for many different people. So it was almost impossible to satisfy everyone. Uh, so going into it, I understood why they were doing the, the sort of... Uh, the, the, the linear sort of story form where it was like, this is 1989, this is what happened in 1997. I felt like they were trying to get to something and I was just waiting for when is that point? When are they going to start telling a story? And then sure enough, uh, I felt that the story came in after the quad studio shooting. This movie for me was mainly about Tupac being shot. The LT Hutton and Benny Boom wanted to make a movie about Tupac being shot. They wanted yeah. to sort of mention certain conspiracies that we've all heard over the years, but not necessarily committing to any of them. Um, you can really tell with with how uh, the Nigel, you know, which you know we found out afterwards is Haitian Jack. You can you can tell how that sort of unraveled, and there were scenes where Biggie was telling him about Nigel, and he was, oh, this is a spoiler free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh shit. Okay. I don't think that's a spoiler though. Okay, okay, that's fine. Um, okay, so he was so he was basically telling him you got to watch out for Nigel, and you'll notice that that was the very same thing that happened in the Notorious movie. In the Notorious movie, when Biggie met up with Pac, when it was played by Anthony Mackie, uh, that, and that was horrible, by the way, Anthony Mackie. <laughs> but in certain points, he was better than uh, than than what's his name uh, than Demetrius Ship. In certain points, he was better because he had the sort of charisma and the livelihood that Pac. But that's another. But in that movie too, you had Biggie telling him watch out for Haitian Jack watch out for Nigel so 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 I guess it's widely known that the the quad studio shooting is connected to Nigel but that's where everything started to unravel and that's a story they wanted to tell and they committed to it until like you said they went right back to and this is what happened this year and that's what happened this year and that's when the movie well I'll tell you the specific moment for me where the movie just completely lost me where I knew I was just gonna watch a shit movie uh, 15 minutes into the movie, and I believe Pac didn't really really talk in th the first 5 or 10 minutes of the movie because it was like his childhood and then whatever, and then he started to speak to the interviewer. Um, 15 minutes into the movie, 
they decided to have him reenact the juice scene. And, <laughs> and for me, as soon as it was happening, as soon as you saw Pac with the fake Omar Epps and you saw him by the lockers, I said, no, don't do this, don't do this. And then he did the, I don't give a fuck about you. I don't get, and, and it, it was, kept going. and it just did not <laughs> land. It didn't land. And I was like, guys, this is, so he wasn't, a, a, a casting was the main thing for me, uh, you know, in a nutshell. It wasn't just a story. It was the casting. Well, but I would say the opposite, man. I would it, say okay. a lot of the people did their best with what was given. <laughs> okay. You know, but I felt like, like, uh, I think, I think like Afini Shakur, her character. Oh, she was amazing. I felt like we could have gotten a whole movie of just about her. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, actually, can we just go back to her? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what is she going through? You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, continue, continue. Yeah, uh, it, to me it started with casting, but I wouldn't necessarily say that he's a bad actor. This is a lot of heavy lifting that he had to do. I mean, you wouldn't make a movie about Steve Jobs and hire a first-time actor or Channing Tatum. No, you hire Michael Fassbender to play Steve Jobs because he's You a hire team. Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> Ashton remember. Kutcher, too, on the, lower, <laughs> on the lower end of that. You know, so you have a complex character. I mean, I can easily say in my lifetime, one of the most complex people in all of pop culture. I think he's top 10, right? We can easily say that. And all the dimensions that he has, it's not going to be portrayed well by a first time actor. All those emotions, those wide range of emotions, he's not going to be able to capture that. And I felt that the first 10 minutes of the movie, I knew he was in over his head. I was, ugh. I wanted to like it. I wanted to. I don't have a rating system. I'll just say, Casting. Casting. Uh, do you, would you just say, do you want to go see it or not? Like, just, you know. What was that? Like, I, I would just say, like, should you spend the money to go see it or not? <laughs> you should spend the money to go see it because I think this is a movie people are going to end up hate watching in the future. <laughs> I think this is going to be hate watching. Can you see that? Do you think it's that bad? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not The Room. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, not. Yeah, that's it's, what I mean. It's like, not that terrible. But, yeah, it's, it's but, not shit. It's just like, yeah, eh, it doesn't satisfy anybody. I think. Yeah, you know, uh, I think it's a, like if you haven't heard about Tupac ever, and this is like your first sort of glance into it. I guess that would be satisfactory. Yeah, but um, whereas with like, I mean, I have to compare it to this film because it's the closest hip hop biopic that's come out. But Straight Outta Compton, I felt like did more justice to its subject matter Absolutely. than this film did. Yeah. Um, this film, and now we're getting into the spoiler review territory. I think okay? I spoiled so many things. I'm sorry, I'm not following these guidelines. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> but um, so basically, uh, the Strata Compton movie. I think that movie spoke more to who N.W.A. was than this film does. N.W.A. are very basic group of guys from the late '80s. They were just telling you this is what is going on in the hood right now. And that movie reflected that in a way. It's like, boom, this is what's going on, and we're telling you what's going on. It's not perfect. We're not perfect people. We're just telling you what it is. Uh, n now, they kind of, they did sort of gloss over stuff to make Dre look like he was, like, the greatest guy ever. But I did like their depiction of Ice Cube. I, I think Ice Cube was the, the best focal point of the movie. To show, like, hey, he wasn't, like, gangsta, but he was living that, and he was observing it, and that's how he reflected that in his music. You know what I mean? Um... This Tupac movie, I felt like Tupac is a lot more, like you said, he's a lot more complex character. And I felt like this film, rather than trying to grab any of that, just sort of threw its hands up at trying. It started at first when you got the, you saw Tupac as a kid being the sort of, wow, the, you know, the wide-eyed looking up to um, his, uh, his uh, adoptive uh, dad. And um, adoptive dad, is that how you say that? His a stepdad? stepdad. Yeah, yeah, his stepdad. And just sort of like, you know, wow, that guy's cool. I want to be like him. Yeah, I'd rather live on my feet than, you know, starve on my knees. You know, like just... Yeah, wasn't just, that a... I mean, I know that's a that's a, that's an actual saying, but didn't 50 say that in uh, Get Rich or Die Trying? I think so. I think but, he said I mean, that. I'd rather pretty, die on my knees. He than was like parroting someone, so, you know. But, like, it, it just... Sh that phrase is showing the sort of, like, the mentality of these black activists at this time. You know what I'm saying? And I felt like it was good because it was reflecting this is how he get he got these ideas. Um, my problem with the movie is when they start going into... Well, okay, the, one of the first things that was my problem with the movie... Okay, partially it was the way the D Demetrius trip was acting, but I think that was informed by the script. Like, when he first goes into the studio, we're, we've only seen, like, 
two scenes maybe with him in the studio, and all of a sudden he's getting into the sound engineer's ear going like, yeah. no, nah, we're going to do it this way. Yeah. And it's just like, who the fuck are you <laughs> yeah. to tell anybody how to be doing anything? Like, I understand being passionate and being like, no, 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 I want it to sound imperfect. And, like, going against what people would expect a recording to sound like, fine. But, like, shouting in people's ears, meanwhile, Digital Underground's in the background, like, dude, why is it that serious, man? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, yeah, like, I thought... Um, I thought that could have been just done better, showing how he's more passionate about music than basically anyone else in the studio. You know what I mean? Uh, they could have done that in a better way than just him getting in people's faces. Um, you know what? You are right. There was never, uh, unless I'm forgetting, there was never a moment where it was like he he gave you his ethos about music. It was, it was yeah. it, I, I, ne- I never got that scene. And you figure with somebody like Pac, you were going to get that moment. And you never got that. Yeah, especially later in the film. Okay, so the you know what I you know what the point is I think that really brought me out of the film? It was at the tail end, the postscript, when they said Tupac released uh, uh you know nine albums while he was alive and seven albums when he was dead. And I just thought about the fact that wait a minute, we never saw that. We never saw yeah. him in the studio uh, over a pen just sitting looking at the pad and going I, I want to write more. Or in the studio late night when everyone else has gone home and he's going like, no, 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 I still want to record. We never saw that passion. We never saw that real anger come out and, and the frustration, the the the, uh, um, the being prolific, just writing and doing and creating. I felt like we never got that, that that uh, n- not even like a, what, what's the word, um, a montage, you know what I mean, of him in the studio really putting shit together. I felt like we got... Him recording the album after he got out of jail, and then as far as like they showed us, he didn't do anything else. He mm-hmm. recorded two albums and then he died. Yeah. But then the postscript is like, oh, he had seven albums worth of material that he recorded between being released and done. Where the hell was that? Why didn't we see that? That's an incredible work ethic that we just glossed over in this two and a half hour film. But you he did I mean? manage to somehow perform Hail Mary. <laughs> yeah, I was like. <laughs> After, Wait a minute. Which is released after he died. So that's What's interesting. Wrong here? Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> oh, that's specifically the like I didn't I didn't one hundred percent know about that, but something in my mind was going like, what did this release after he died? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like so, yeah. In fact, that specifically uh, the performances really pissed me off. As I'm watching this movie, a lot of these performances are maybe like two minutes each, and it's just like. Why are you showing all of this performance? It's just him wa- walking back and forth on the stage. Like, this isn't Michael Jackson where it's like, oh my god, let's uh, pay homage to his dance steps and how great you know, he looks. But you, you know, know, like, but you know what, though? I mean, that's obviously laid there for the, f- for the grassroots Pac fan. That's there for the guy who... He's not coming into it for, I want to see this side of Tupac. I want to see that side of Tupac. I just want to hear music. I mean, there were people in the theater when I was there, and they were, you know, of course, they were dancing. They were doing whatever the hell they were doing. it's great music. It's great music. Yeah, that's all they really cared about. So, I mean, you could just view it as just lazy directing because it is kind of lazy because it's pandering. It's just like, well, yeah, just take that. You know what I'm saying? So, it's that's all you can really take it as. Because with a lot of artists, um, you know, like uh, rock artists, pop artists, um, 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 R&B singers, a lot of what they're doing is songs that other people had written for them, right? Yeah. And so, <clears throat> I can understand not wanting to focus on the music as much, focus more on their life, but with rappers, specifically Tupac, these are all his words. These are all things that were inspired by his real life. And whereas, earlier points of the movie, they show like, oh, boom, this thing was inspired by this. Hey, he was reading about how girls were, uh, you know, um, uh, putting babies in the dumpster when he was in New York all the freaking time. Mm-hmm. That's what inspired Brenda had, Brenda's got a baby. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wanted to see more of those moments. And it felt like I never got that. And it felt like, specifically when I was listening to these songs with these great lyrics, and I'm like, where are the moments that inspired these lyrics? There was one That's a bit deep. That's a bit that. deep. I mean, but, there, but there was one point where they did that. They did it with Dear Mama, right? Where it was like, yeah. oh my God, my mom is the only one who has my back. And as she's leaving, you hear that song playing. And it's like, yeah. I'm getting the inspiration because this mother was there for him all the time. That's where we could get those moments. It felt like there was one moment where they did that and everything else was, oh, why is he performing Hail, Hail Mary for like two minutes? 
it looks exactly like the same concert footage of him walking around in the last song. Yeah. So why is he doing this? It would have been great if they showed, like, he had moments of paranoia. He had moments of, like, not being able to trust anybody. And then if you could see, like, a, just a mini montage of that with the performance of the mm-hmm. song, that would have worked. But instead, it was just bare bones, just... Yeah, I know he. Perf- I know he did the song. Like, I'm not an idiot. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was just like I just didn't like how they didn't utilize how great his music was for the effect of making a movie telling you about this person's life. Um, in fact, uh, I would say one one moment does the exact opposite of that. Uh, it, it felt more like an apology for uh, uh, his his misogyny than actually trying to, like, explain the dichotomy of someone who's able to, like, you know, um, actually care about women, but also do these songs where he calls women bitches and hoes. It's like, what? Mm-hmm. How does that work? You know, um, when he performs, keep your head up, right? You know, <laughs> so the, you have this moment where the director is coming at him and he's like, so what about this, uh, yeah. what about, uh, you know, when you got big and you got on, what was the song that you put out? It was... Uh, it wasn't Brent. You weren't making Brenda's got a baby. You were making I get around. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where he calls these. He's like, oh man, these hoes are always trying to get on me, trying to get the ladder. You know. But Tupac had like, a good counter to that. He had a good counter to that. He said, "What? <laughs> oh, I can't. I can't have fun. I, no, I, can't, well, I can't have fun on my records." I mean, there's a difference between having fun and calling women bitches and hoes. Like, how does that have to be fun? You know what I mean? Like, and that's the thing. Instead of confronting that. They uh, they showed him performing "Keep Your Head Up," and then they cut to like him helping out this random woman with kids. It's like, huh? huh? See how great of a yeah. guy Tupac was? Forget about all the bitches and hoes stuff that he said. He was a great guy. We swear. And it's yeah. like, no, like confront that. Hey, have him be wrong, or have him have a counter that really means something that says like, well, you know what? Boom. There are some women that I've experienced in my life that are like this. And, th- and, and like, this song is for that. But I also have the songs that are like this. And this is how this manifests. I want to show the reality of these two natures. Hey, mm-hmm. some, uh, you know, I'm not saying this has to be right, but boom. Hey, some women act like hoes and some women I want to support. Just something that confronts this instead of just going, Well, they, they, they confronted I mean, it. On. They confronted it in their own way. They confronted Man. it when Hill Harper, you know, when he was asking him about Doris Tucker... Um, Dolores, I'm sorry. Oh, see Dolores Tucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah when he was yeah. asking him about that, and he was, you know, he was just saying, "Come on, Pac." Like, and and they they went back and forth for a little bit, and I feel that that's what they wanted to give anybody who was going to critique the film. That's all they were willing to give you. They were just willing yeah. to to give you those interview scenes, and it's like there we questioned yeah. him. Moving on, that's not the story we want to tell. Uh, a story, a story that you could tell all those different things about Pac would probably have to be something that's on a, you know, that's going to have to be like a Netflix series. If you don't get that's that, what I was thinking. Yeah, if you don't get that out of a Netflix series, then there's something really wrong with the storytelling. But 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 to me, I feel like I almost feel like the rap community doesn't have to hear that from Pac. They don't have to hear the reassurance that he's not a misogynist because Tupac was the only mainstream person at the time that was making records like Keep Your Head Up, that was making those sort of, even though he made the obvious, you know, the, the misogynistic records that everybody, you know, always made, he participated in that in, in that whole thing. But at the very least, he gave you that. You know, Biggie never gave you that. Yeah. You know, Jay- you, know, you, you know, want to know why I, I, I think the way so I So I, just don't, I just don't feel like the hip-hop community or, or, or the fans feel like that's a necessity or that was ever really an issue. From a societal no, standpoint... What I mean is, yeah. what I mean is, he had a song called Wonder Why They Call You Bitch. Yeah. And it was literally at the end, he was like, see, Dolores Tucker keeps stressing me, mm-hmm. and I wanted to let her know, why we call these hoes bitches. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know, at least some explanation. Like, it's not like he never confronted it or said anything about it. Mm-hmm. He had songs where he talked about it. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. And so it's like... W- one of his least, someone, well, not one of his, you know, well-known records. No, but, but it is on All Eyes on Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it's on that album that's... Oh, and by the way, do you love how they tried to do that? They were like... What are we gonna call this album? Hmm. I'm it's gonna like, call you the I, ca- I kind of feel like everybody's everybody's l- l- looking at me. I just <laughs> but you know what? They mentioned it. They mentioned it before. 
So yeah, th- because it was already he right. has a song called All Eyes on Me already. Because <laughs> when he was interviewed when he was being interviewed, he said All Eyes on Me is on top of the charts or whatever. And then ten minutes later, there was the scene that was supposed to be like this big moment where it was like, Okay, here's the name, but it's like, but you guys just mentioned it about ten minutes ago, remember? <laughs> like how does that make any like, sense? They tried to do the aftermath scene at the end of Strata Compton, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah, 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 like, yeah. What are you gonna call it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so bad. Probably. Now, uh, I, I want to also mention something that you caught, and, dude, I, I just I just didn't. And everybody caught it, and I just, I never caught it. I never caught the Snoop voiceover. I oh, my God. I just going to get invitation. I, Snoop Dogg. Bad on yo, me, I okay. guess. So, they, so, you're watching this movie, and you're getting this guy who looks nothing like Snoop Dogg at all. Like, yeah. he's got a bigger nose, he's got a skinnier yeah. face. Like, it's just, this is not him. And then. His nose kind of looked like Shock G's. <laughs> Like, yeah, like exactly. Yeah. Like they changed noses. He's got, he's got he Humpty's nose. Talking, and you hear 2017 Snoop Dogg speaking out of his mouth. I'm like, what the hell is it? Literally, every time he spoke, the audience in my screening laughed. Because they were like, this is ridiculous. Oh, God. <laughs> like, I know that's not this guy talking. <laughs> Didn't catch it. No, me. that was ridiculous the way they had that whole setup working. I was like, could they not just get a guy who could just do a high voice? That sounded like he was smoked out all the time. They, it was that that hard? They couldn't replace Snoop Dogg, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. That one was particularly bad. Um, uh, no, and and then, uh, you know you know what uh, specifically kind of got on my nerves? Okay, so after a while, uh, Afina Shakur plants herself as a very strong female lead, right? And actually, a, a, a thing that was really always fascinated me about... Well, not fascinated me, but always like sort of confused me about who she was, right? black revolutionary you know um um you know sticking it to the man sort of thing but then you find out through tupac's lyrics that she did crack and she was like addicted mm-hmm. to crack for a long time and i wanted to find like i watched this movie partially and i'm like yeah what was the moment that got this person who's supposed to be all black revolutionary what how how did she get on crack like what was the thing that happened and it's basically never explained it's just one day she's just kind of tired a lot you know what i mean mm-hmm. and then like we don't see until like halfway through his childhood and he's like oh what uh she just got drugs no you shouldn't be doing that and it's just like well how did this even start in the first place because that's that's a really big leap you know what i mean like something has to have happened in your life to take you from that place to this one you know and it felt like it never gave us that again that that was uh that that was there you all right people you've heard dear mama right you know she was a crack fiend moving on that wasn't the part of the story that we wanted to tell. It's just bad storytelling. It's just yeah, yeah. terrible, terrible. You know, I'm sorry to be so apathetic about it, but that's what it was. It was, you know, LT Hutton said something, and I want to know your opinion about this because I don't know what the hell he's talking about. He said, and he said this in multiple interviews, LT Hutton, for you guys that don't know, he was, he was one of the directors for, for, uh, for this film. Uh, he said what he wanted to tell was the story of who Tupac was, who he wanted to be, no, who Tupac was, who he is, and who he wanted to be. How, I, I, I don't see that. If you lay a grid over this movie, I don't see, you know, or could you see possible um, spurts of that? I of see, what he wanted uh, to be. First, let's start with what he yeah. wanted to be. The wanted to be doesn't make sense to me because that's where I feel that the movie should have been uh, the sort of fantasy, right? Because with all biopics, we have that element of that didn't really happen, but it's reflective of what his music was trying to do, right? Um, I felt like early in the movie, we have all this talk about how he wants to use like everyday people from the streets to help motivate change. He doesn't want to use scholars. He doesn't want to use guys who went to college. No, it's kind of like a reflection of the Black Panther movement. It wasn't made up of people who went to college. It was made up of everyday people who just wanted to join the cause. And so that's what he was trying to do. And I believe he said that at one point in the movie. Where was that at any point in the movie? Where was the point where he's rolling with guys and he's like, nah, we're doing things to help the community. We're doing things with this, that, and the third. You saw the Panthers around him after he got shot. That's when you saw the Panthers. That's it. We never see, like, a point of him, because he even talks about, like, well, not oh, the Panthers. It was the Nation of Islam, I believe. Yeah, that's what, that's remember that one guy who comes up to him and is like, you ain't done shit for the hood, and he's like, yes, I have. I spend millions of dollars. I send money to this. And yeah. it's like, where were those points? I didn't see that happen. You know what I mean? So yeah. where was that? Like, we, I needed more of that fantasy. I needed more of the manifestation of how he felt he should have been in his music 
into uh, uh, the movie and the depiction of his character to at least show, like, this is what I wanted to happen. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Even if that didn't end up happening in real life. Uh, like, that's what you could have done with a biopic. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Or you could have shown how your music is affecting people. Uh, showing some people going like, hey, I was thinking about doing this, but I decided I'm going to be a street soldier. I'm going to be using, uh, using like, uh, using my nine instead of just kill people and sell drugs. I'm going to use it to protect our community from this, that, and the third. Uh, they gave it, they gave it, I, I guess there's like the moment where he goes up to the, to, to those white guys who were harassing that black dude, yeah. and he shoots them, and it turns out they were undercover cops. Oh, in this movie, like, every cop is a bad guy. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> it was just like, it got comical at points, I was like, okay, guys, <laughs> like, everyone is out to get you mm-hmm. all the time, like, guys, I don't think it's that serious. Some By the way, just... <laughs> that was the first time the crowd like really there was a roar in the crowd when he shot at them and all you heard all i heard was real shit real shit real shit (laughs) that's all people kept saying in the back so you you know so um every cop was i mean that's kind of similar to straight out of compton i guess but you know but straight out of compton you definitely got a sense where you know that's that was it was established as much more of a period piece, so to sort of gist it up, it's like that's how police were at that time. Obviously, that's not yeah. how they all were. You, you know, we're not stupid. We understand that. But in order to tell yeah. the story, that's how it had to be. And in this movie, you didn't get the relation between Tupac and the police, so it just came off as the cops being assholes just for no reason. Not to tell <laughs> yeah. any story, but they were just assholes because they were assholes. That's like, uh, uh, they could have had like one or two throwaway lines like, oh, fuck the police, huh? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah, slap yeah, 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 yeah. the header. Something like that to show that they at least knew who he was, yeah. you know. Um, and then there was the whole like the the rape case, uh, just fiasco, which was tied into the way that they were like, "What? Tupac never did anything bad to women. He's mm-hmm. a great guy." And it was just like, "Look, I don't know one hundred percent of the things, but like, all right, you're doing too much to try to cover for him. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it just felt like they were just they tried to like." smear on the being kind to Tupac and then like, alright, let's forget about that. And, uh, and oh, like, oh, okay, we were talking about who's the villains of the movie. You're assuming it's gonna be Suge Knight. No. The villains of the movie were yeah. fucking Haitian Jack and, and the that chick victim. who, yeah, and that chick who, uh, filed <laughs> that, the lawsuit against the him. The scene, the scene where <laughs> Tupac, where they gave him his charges, she was sitting across from the courtroom with the most satisfied look on her face. Oh my it God. was so, It was the most evilest, most pl- diabolic <laughs> look of the whole movie. And you know what? And let me be honest with you. Like, I'm, I'm not. I mean, we could both agree that when it comes to these sort of movies, that you tend to 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 take more seriously the social aspects of it. You know, I kind of feel like it's a. That's what the times were, and that's what made it. It's not like that anymore. The rap culture isn't like that anymore. We're just revisiting. Yeah, yeah revisiting how insensitive it was towards women so i I get it i get it why it's kind of dismissed and it's overlooked and why it's like bitches and whatever you know whatever the fuck but that look that they gave her it they were trying hard because she she went like this she was like like almost like a bond villain that's what she looked like she looked like a bond (laughs) villain it's like she could have just smiled and she would have been like yay i'm happy but no it was just like yeah motherfucker i was and, you know, it could have been the case. I don't know. I don't know much about Tupac's rape case. I don't know much about it. If you if you can shed some light on it, I don't know many details of what he said um, happened. Or... I mean, I'm willing to believe as much as they say in the movie where it's like, oh, well, I don't know. It felt like a little bit like he did absolutely nothing. And it's like, I mean, all right. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. Like, he, she gave me a massage and then she left. And then all of a sudden, what? I'm involved in a rape case? Ah, how ridiculous, you know? Well, was um, it, it? It also could have been a thing because also, um, you know, obviously, oh, yeah. since, since we're spoiling it, it's obviously a thing where, okay, he met Haitian Jack, he met Nigel, yeah, and then actually. later on they were in the hotel room. So it's like Nigel was the villain of the movie. It was not It was not Suge Knight. Suge Knight was a threat, but he wasn't perceived he was as herring. the big... Yeah, he wasn't perceived he, as the Suge big Knight bad wolf. He was literally a red herring. No, explain so, what you're gonna say. Yeah. So you were so you were probably just supposed to assume the worst that Nigel did something terrible to this girl and Tupac did nothing. He was innocent. So I don't I didn't I didn't look at it as oh Tupac's not misogynistic or whatever the fuck. I just looked at it as Nigel did it. That's what we feel. You know, Nigel totally screwed over Pac and he was the biggest fork in, in Tupac's road. 
Or maybe the chick was in on it and they just wanted to get money out of Tupac. Or it could have been that like too. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like, whoa, they're tackling as each individual case and we never hear about where Haitian Jack's case goes. It's just completely on him, even though he allegedly had nothing to do with what was going on. So what the fuck? You mm-hmm. know, like it was the shakedown. It was all like a setup. Yeah. Um, now, going back to Suge Knight, okay? So they... He looks Samoan. <laughs> no, he looks they set him up. <laughs> Look, all right, all right. So here's here's the cool thing about the movie. It starts off with sort of like Tupac is in jail, and the only person who was able to get him out was not the record label that he was with. It, it was this new guy, uh, Suge Knight, who was like, "Boom, I'm willing to throw three million at you right now." I'm a He's man. Stopped, Nobody fuck leave. with me. You like that dialogue? Nobody fuck with yeah. me. I'm a man. <laughs> Some men aren't but, born men. I'm born a man. Nobody fuck with but, me. But here's the thing. Mm-hmm. They were doing the sort of, okay, this is the deal with the devil sort of scene. Yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. Do you want to stay in jail and not be able to make music? Mm-hmm. Or do you want to get out and, you know, get out this California Love number one hit song? You know what I mean? Like, what do you want to do? Mm-hmm. And so he's he has the deal with him. And then he's like, we can sort of see in a typical, in, in a I would say in a movie with that that's trying to build up a plot thread, right? You have the deal with the devil, and then you have maybe where that goes wrong at some point. And it almost feels like they're about to do that. They have two instances where uh, Suge Knight just beats the crap out of people. Yeah. Like, one scene, we have no idea why it happens. The second scene is like, oh, you're trying to steal money from me? And he starts shoving food in the guy's face and just, like, you know, ruining his clothes. But, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> like, it was really stupid. Like, they were just like, oh, uh, you like eating? Huh? Have some more. Yeah. Have some steak. Yeah. Have some shrimp. And it was just like, it was silly. Okay. <laughs> like, this isn't that threatening. <laughs> but you also got a sense of how Pac perceived uh, Suge's random acts of violence. In the scene where he was trying to force feed the guy the food, you got a sense that Tupac was looking at it like something's wrong. Something's wrong. This is, you know, this is a moral. This is morally wrong. But then when Suge cracks a joke two seconds later, Tupac just laughs it off. Also with the scene that happened earlier where they drag some guy in the hallway and they just beat the shit out of him. Pac was just laughing and making records. He was like, what the fuck did he do? So yeah. it didn't. So it's it. So it's still giving you. You could probably assume that that's how Pac would look at something like that because well, obviously it, the neighborhoods that he's from. This is something that just happens every day. You know. Yeah, but it doesn't give weight to the situation, especially for someone who was just talking about how he wants to uplift black people. But that's what, see. But this is what you have to understand. Together. This is what you have to understand, though. Where you would see a random act of violence as something that needs to be addressed, or you know, people just randomly getting the shit kicked out of them. That's something who he grew up in watching that. He grew up in I watching people do that. So j- a guy getting roughed up, he just assumes, okay, he did something stupid. But, Actually, no. Yeah. But I would say, look at what happens earlier in the film. Mm-hmm. Remember when we see that uh, that dude, I think, uh, DeRay, the, the comedian guy? But he was playing the dude who Dura- was Yeah, that was distracting. Bar. I don't know why they casted him. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah. But he starts beating up that guy, and you see Tupac looking at it like, mm-hmm. oh my God, like what's going on? This is the guy that I looked up to, and now he's beating the crap out of people. I okay. thought they were going to do, like, a plot thread with, like, I'm going to stop this because now I'm older and I'm bolder and I'm saying... No, you know, you no, no, thing. no. But but what I mean is, like, no. they set it up. They set it up where it's like, here's this guy, this act of violence, and I'm paralyzed. I don't do anything before. We also have the scene of him uh, fighting back against the two... Uh, shooting back at the two white cops. So why... But that's a racial see... issue. That's a racial issue. That's but different. What... But if he's trying to uplift people and we're setting it up that he's supposed to be this black revolutionary, why is it when violence is happening, or, or, but when it's a black guy doing the violence, <laughs> come on, are you, a good time. Is that really like, surprising? On. Is that surprising to you at all? But what it, I mean... Is it, that really I, I surprising? Like, but if you're trying to do this type of movie, why is that sort of thing left off? And but, even so, right? Even if you're saying that uh, he laughs us off, maybe this is sort of like him sort of giving into the gangster lifestyle, right? Going mm-hmm. like, oh man, hey, that's just what happens. Maybe you could do a point of him, he's losing himself, he's losing that revolutionary ideal in this gangster shit. You know what I mean? He thought that he could elevate people up out of it, but what happens is when you put your life into it, you get lost in it. We never have that confrontation of that. Um, well, you got fact, you got it fact, with Hill Harper. Well, you had that. You had that moment. They did. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, but to someone who it matters to, mm-hmm. it felt like his mom should have confronted him. It felt like his girlfriend should have confronted him. It felt like Jada Pinkett Smith 
she kind of does, but it's like at the last second and she doesn't really talk about anything specific. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, okay, that scene where his mom shows up on the set of Gridlocked and, like, talks to him, that mm-hmm. scene goes absolutely nowhere. It's just like, oh, hey, I'm showing up. Looks like you're doing really good, Pac. Haha, <laughs> thanks, Mom. Anyway, and it just goes on the next scene. I was like, oh, okay. Like, I thought there was going to be, like, a sort of slap it upside the head. Like, get your shit together. What the fuck are you doing? Like, we're supposed to be changing the goddamn world, and you're talking about all this, you know. Like, wouldn't it have been cool if, like, she rolled up on him uh, at the uh, How Do You Want It music video or uh, set of that music video or something like that. It was just like, you got fucking porn stars in your goddamn music video? What the hell's this shit? <laughs> you know? Like, I felt like this movie could have been so, could have been doing so much more. And in points where that should have happened, it ended up just being story beat, story beat, story beat, story beat. Instead of, like, make this mean something. Like, the point where... Um, hold on, because yeah, you're I- mentioning a lot. Hold on, hold on. I want, I want to go back to okay. the, the scene where you were talking about D-Ray. See, but you could yeah. easily make the case and say he saw that when he was younger. So that just becomes the norm. That just becomes the norm. And it's not like Tupac did random acts of violence in the movie. So you could easily say that the looks that he gives Suge Knight is that he knows that morally or ethically, I'm, I never remember the, the, the difference, um, morally or ethically, he knows that it's wrong, which is why you never saw Pac bully people in the movie. You didn't see him do that himself. Except I mean, he's at not, the end. He's, Except at the end. Oh, well, of course. At the end, he just didn't give a shit anymore. He was just, you know, he was just, that's it. He was but gone. You could say that's a manifestation of that energy, you know? Or you know what? No. Or you know what? No, because that wasn't a random act of violence. That was that was gang-related. Orlando Anderson was a crip. This is this was a retaliation for something that he did. I think he took someone's chain uh, or, and yeah. they beat the chain off of him. So that was, that. you know, I'm not saying it, it was it was okay. But what I'm saying is that there, there were no random acts of violence committed by him so I kind of oh. looked at it in the same way as the scene with Ice Cube in in Straight Outta Compton when he was on the bus and the, you know OG whatever the guy is he gets on the he gets on the on the bus and he gives that motivational speech to the kids with the gun and Ice Cube is watching that happen he's he's watching it happen and he's learning you know he, he's learning sort of the rules in his upbringing obviously he sees What's the dumb it? shit that the kids do but it's yeah. it's the same as that with Pac the Pac, the look that Pac gives it I can, I can see that that makes sense if he sees if he sees it at a young age you're sort of desensitized to it so he sees Suge do it it's not like he's going to jump in the middle and say Suge this is wrong we got to do this for our people if he does shit like that the movie would be horrible because they're trying to portray him as a superhero and that's just not realistic no. Well, I mean, the movie's not realistic, so if we're just going to go with that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, or maybe not manifested through that, but just through something. Like I said, it shows him shooting back at two cops, so it's not like we're not into showing him as someone who's willing he to did go that. against he, the norm. Yeah, he actually did that, yeah. Yeah, but so it's like, all right, if you're going to go with it, go all the but way that's out a, But it. dude, that's a like, racial, like showed, but that's racially charged. They saw Dr. Dre is straight out of Compton talking about, man, we ain't going to do this. I'm out of here. You know, if they're willing to show it with that movie, how come they can't show it with this movie? <laughs> but hold on. But you're OK. So you, you do understand that you're 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 comparing a random act of of just violence in the well, inner city. See, here's my thing. It's and and let me finish. Act. Let me finish. And then okay. you're comparing that to two white people beating up on one guy when you know the the story started with the Black Panthers. Like it started with that thing. So you get a little bit of that when you see two white guys beating the shit out of one person. So even though you didn't get the ideology and you didn't get the big speeches, you got to see that if I see two people beating up a guy that I don't even know I'm going to defend them. That was racially charged. If Shug Knight is beating the shit out of somebody, that's a completely different scenario. You wouldn't expect but, Pac to to get in the middle see, of that. that wasn't a random act, though. It was him owing him money. Every time he talked about, like, oh, you thought you could just steal off of my plate? You know what I mean? It wasn't like, ah, I just feel like beating up some guy for my But Tupac didn't today. know. But Tup- Tupac didn't know. He said, what did he do? He doesn't even know who that is. He doesn't even know who that guy is. And and the second guy got food force fed to him. <laughs> you know, it's like I was so dumb. It was so stupid. It was so goofy. But you know, but but, but Suge Knight was just like you said, he was a red herring. It's it, the the villain of the movie was it was uh, it was Nigel. He was the terrible person. I know Haitian Jack is still alive. I don't know what he has to say about the movie. <laughs> if anything, it just makes his reputation of that much more better. I don't know if he's still involved in any of that stuff. But uh, no, but this yeah. is what I'd say though. This is what I say though. 
the reason why I say that it's a problem and it never really gets addressed is because when we get to the scene where Tupac walks with uh, uh, Suge Knight into that room where the first guy got beat up, you get that build up because everyone in the audience is like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, yeah. something's about to go down. Because what happens right before that, right, is Tupac, apropos of fucking nothing. Like, Tupac is just like, I fulfilled my contract. I want to strike it out on my own. I want to make my own music. And it's never like a, you know, that was a right moment for them to go like, hey, I kind of don't like seeing all these guys getting beat up. I kind of don't like the way you know, your business involves all this violence. I'm going to try to do things my way. I'm going to mm-hmm. try to change. I want to do movies. I want to build out. I want to expand. I felt like that was the opportunity for them to have him looking back on those moments of violence and say, I'm trying to do something better. But they didn't do that. What they ended up doing was, he one day he's talking to his girlfriend, who, by the way, he gets just, like, real fucking easy. Like, it's literally, she's introduced by, um, she, I think she's Quincy jo- one of Quincy Jones' yeah, daughters. Yeah. And he walks up to her and he's like, hey, baby, let me kick a little game to you. And she's like, oh, aren't you the one who insulted my dad? And, like, this really horrible racial thing. And she starts walking away and he's like, oh, shit, I didn't know that was her. And he comes up and he's like, hey, Shakespeare quote, yeah, you like yeah, me now. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, what the fuck? But <laughs> Shakespeare, Shakespeare usage in this movie was heavy. There's a lot of yeah. Shakespeare in this movie. But um, what was, I, what was I leading up to? Oh, yeah. So, basically, he's just talking to her one day, and he's just like, you know, I feel like just doing things on my own. I'm going to go talk to Suge. I'm sure he'll be fine with it. You know, uh, so he goes in to talk to him, and he says, hey, I'm trying to get out of the contract. And Suge's like, "Uh uh-uh, it's more than just you owing me three albums. Look at all this money. Uh, Look at all the expenses that we put into, you know, putting out your album. Look at all this stuff that we have to recoup first before we're able to be square. And he's like, this shit is more than just album sales. And then I'm saying, I, I was thinking like, oh, this is where we're seeing the deal with the devil is coming through. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is the sort of like, okay, we're seeing what's going on. Maybe this isn't the reason why he was killed or whatever, but we're saying like, oh, someone could say that, hey, uh, because he didn't get his money back and Tupac was trying to strike it out, oh, you could put him on the list of reasons, you know, somebody could have killed, or just whatever. Just having some sort of element of like, you know, some treachery is afoot, right? But then you get to that third part, and it's like, oh god, he's taking him into that room where he took those other guys, we yeah. took that other guy to beat the crap out of him, and oh, Suge Knight's completely okay with him striking it out, mm-hmm. like uh, w- with the uh, death row east or whatever. Oh, he was completely okay with that. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like it really is that moment where you thought it was going to lead to something. You have this setup with him beating the crap out of people and saying that you're basically in debt to me for longer than you think, and then. No, I'm Shug Knight, and I'm completely willing to compromise with you, Tupac. It's like, so, oh. in a, so in a sense, <laughs> this was, so in a sense, Shug Knight was the Dre of this movie. He was the Dre in this movie because they toned down those awful aspects of of Suge Knight, and they didn't make him seem like he was as terrible as he as he really was. So, mm. in, in a way, he kind of was the Dre. They made him look a little better than. Uh, th- th- than he actually was, but I mean, what consequences did you think was going to happen in that scene? Was he going to—he wasn't going to kill Tupac. I, I've ne- no. in all the years, in all 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 the years that I've heard about Tupac or Suge Knight, it's never ever been speculated that tu- that that Suge Knight laid a hand on him. You no. know, no. No. unless no, you're meaning uh, unless what you're meaning to say is you expected a threat or some form of him trying to strong arm him, then I can understand. But if if you're expecting him to put his hands on him, that never, I've never heard rumors of that ever happening. And with Pac, you've heard a thousand rumors, and that's never even been, that's never even been spoken. But the point, the fact of the matter is, and this is where it goes back to the postscript, right? Yeah. We see that Tupac had seven albums worth of material within him, right? If things were going so well with this death row thing, and absolutely nothing was wrong whatsoever. Why does he have seven albums worth of material recorded, but he doesn't want to release it on death row? Mm-hmm. Like, why would they... It, like, that just feels like something that's never, like, answered. Like, okay, he did the double album, and he did, you know, the first album with him. And he's like, hey, contracts are filled. Let me go do my thing. Yeah. And he's just like, nah, you don't get to just do your thing. It's like, okay, he's obviously being blocked here. And then we obviously have this creative output. It's not like he wasn't... He didn't do anything else yet. He had other stuff, and he obviously like was working on more material. But for some reason, he didn't want to do it with Shook. So 
What was the problem? What we're not even putting uh, any again idea me me, out play, there. me playing devil's advocate here. Uh, what I could what I could say about that is that it's it's been widely known that Tupac considered himself to be an actor before a rapper. You even saw that you saw that in the movie. You saw you know you saw that that, that yeah. little play that he was doing. Um, so he was trying to break into Hollywood, and I think that was going to be more of his. I can assume. I can only assume. I don't fucking. I, I don't fucking have a real answer to your question. I'm just saying that it's possible that it's well. I the contractual whatever agreement I want to leave because I would like to pursue this career in acting. You can see a lot. You can find a lot of interviews online where Tupac is like literally saying it's like I just listen. Rap was just something that I did and I and I and I could do it very well. But at my core, what I am is an actor. Like I like being around actors because he was t- he was on the th- uh, on the set of the, the movie that he did with Tim Roth. Um, I think uh, it was Gridlock, right? Grid, yeah, that, that was Gridlock. Right? I was confused with gang related. That was with, with Belushi. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> but he was saying you know I'm an actor. I'm an actor. That's what, you know that's what I am. So I could only assume that it was a thing where he was just trying to transfer off into that, and he just wanted to leave. That was his motivation. It wasn't that too. Yeah. Yeah, the okay. Knight was going to kill okay. me. But let's have that moment. Let's have that moment of yeah. I don't think I really want to rap anymore. And yeah. Like yeah. no no no. Yeah. You owe me shit. You're mm-hmm. rapping. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. at least have some sort of confrontation. You know, but it ended shitty, up just being like, oh, everything's telling. fine, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, all right, well, if everything's fine there, then, and then, okay, let's talk about the Tupac and Biggie beef that was set up, right? Mm-hmm. So, we have uh, the, the meeting up of Tupac and Biggie, we see them at a party, and it's actually kind of cool, the dialogue they have between each other, and it's like, you said when we were first talking about the movie. That was one of my favorite of, scenes of the movie. That's one of yeah, my favorite scenes of the movie, and the, and the reason why is because... You got to see the difference between Pac and the difference between Biggie. Uh, Biggie, basic. Well, I mean, look. They, I, maybe there's your scene where we're talking about the ethos, but not really. It's you know, B- Pac says, you know, I want to affect people, I want to affect the world, or whatever the hell it is that he says. And Biggie just yeah. goes, I just want people to go in there and buy my album, and that's it. But it didn't. <laughs> yeah, but, but I want to. I want to motivate these people to get this right. get this fucking album so I get this money. But it didn't crit. The, the scene didn't criticize Biggie or belittle Biggie or make him no. seem like he was small minded in the eyes of Pac. It was just like that was him and that's him and moving on one of the only scenes of the movie uh, outside of the Phoenix Shakur scenes where I was like that was well done that was decent yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. um the 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 thing that I didn't like was that okay as far as the film has shown that was the first time Tupac has ever met Biggie but then randomly in the film he's just like he, that dude was sleeping on my couches I was helping him with rap and it was just like Wait, you we were? Never saw, we never saw that. We never saw yeah, that. Yeah, like, when was that? Yeah. We never even saw him, like, in the background sleeping on his couch or something like that. Like, that never happened. As far as we know, they've only met, like, two times. Yeah. You know, as far as this movie shows us, these people have not met that much. You know what I mean? Um, and so that that really kind of annoyed me because when it ended up showing the, the part where he's in jail and he hears the, uh, uh, he hears the... Uh, who shot you? Uh, who shot you? Yeah. And he's like, he's listening, he's like, wait a minute, it must have been Biggie through these yeah, lyrics yeah. that aren't really being... You know what it was kind of like? It, it was kind of like Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind. You saw the way they were just showing the images and he had like this moment, this eureka moment where it was like, God, it all makes sense now. And, and he, what was interesting, see, what was interesting was that as soon as he heard the song, the, 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 the older guy, who, who's Pinky from Friday, I don't know his name. So yeah, P- I was like, Pinky, somebody pointed out, I was like, yo, that's Pinky. That's it. Like, Pinky was already aware of everything that was in his head. Pinky yeah. knew everything Pac was just thinking about, and he had, like, a game plan already. <laughs> the only thing that I could possibly think of is, okay, when people, you know, when street dudes hear these songs, this is, they, they, to them, this is basically, like, people talking. This isn't music news. This is just, hey, mm-hmm. that dude literally said, who shot you? He's making fun of the whole thing. Uh, but it was just so silly the way it was like seconds after he was like, hey, look, hey, look, man, you got to get it together, man. You got to do all this. And it's like, dude, I, I haven't even spoken this to anyone. Like, how the fuck did you know that I was that I felt like this about, about this record? And then, I, I don't know. And then randomly right after that at Pinky, I'm just going to call him Pinky now. Yeah. He Pinky. stabs that guy that was playing uh, the that, music. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Why yeah. did that happen? Because they're in jail. Happen? Because they're in jail, sir. That's what there happens in no jail. Re- you know what I thought? Like, you know what I doing that for him? Yeah, I mean to explain it to explain it to them, 
Uh, so, so in the scene, Tupac was telling the guy to turn the radio up because he wanted to hear who shot you. So when the old guy came in to talk to Pac, he was telling the guy turn it down, and the guy was refusing to turn it down. Eventually, he turned it down. He spoke to Pac, and then he pointed at the guy again. I thought he was gonna tell the guy, and now you could turn it back on, young blood. I thought that's what he was gonna, that he was gonna say. Yeah, but yeah, instead, he too. said, "You got one more chance, nigga." <laughs> I was like, I was I was like, like wow. God damn. Right, that, that was kind of harsh. Like, geez. Yeah, no, I was like, <laughs> shit. And then he just looks at them, like, at the end of the scene, and Tupac, like, if I was Tupac in that scene, I would have been like, why the fuck did you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but, there's absolutely no reason for that. Yeah. He just had to be, I'm surprised we even are allowed to have fucking stereos in here in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. That was, that, that, that so, seemed a little random. But, so, um, what, yeah. what, what could you say that you genuinely, I know it's going to be tough. I know it's going to wow. be tough. But what could you say you genuinely enjoyed about the movie? Besides Afini, you've already expressed that. Uh, yeah, I, I loved her performance. Um, I actually didn't mind the way uh, Demetrius Ship played the character, <sighs> uh, played Tupac. I thought he, uh, uh, not the acting parts, not the part where he's acting, but the part where not the part he's, where he's acting. Where, no, where, the part where he's acting as Tupac acting in a movie. Yeah, oh I mean, the, the parts where he's actually giving off the mannerisms of him. I felt like that was, the, mm. uh, the parts where he's angry at people and the parts where he's like, you know, rebelling against people. I felt like it did it up the best he could. I didn't hear the gravel and anger no. that I hear from no. Tupac. Like, you know, if you hear him when he's actually like legit pissed off, he turns, it's a different voice. And I felt like this Tupac never reached that different voice that you hear, that you hear, that different energy. But I felt like it was pretty good for someone, uh, you know, trying to emulate it. Like when he was doing the music video stuff, it's like, oh, that was pretty cool. You know, having him come in and do that sort of stuff. But as far as really manifesting the story, uh, ugh. Yeah. yeah, and I also hated the ending and the because the fact that it was just like, and then he died. And then yeah. it was like, we're not even going to get into any conspiracy. We're not, he, forget conspiracies, we're not even going to get into how he inspired people. We're not even going to get into, like, his influence. What? We're not even going to, yeah. you know, you saw how, the way uh, Strat of Compton ended where it was like, hey, look what spawned from all of this. We didn't get into any of that at all. It was just... You just saw guess, small, you just... Oh, wow, Thunder. You just saw very, very small pockets of it when he just throws, you know, what he said to the judge, which, you know, yeah. Sh- Shakji, you know, he, he's been quoted to say that he was in the, the, he was in the courtroom when Pac said that, and apparently Pac said that to the judge. So you had that moment, you had the moment at the record, yeah. but it was just like small little just, just, just empty platitudes where, mm-hmm. you're right, the, the character didn't reflect on that quote. Like, where was the follow-up on that, on the, 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 the visionary side? Right. But again, you were never going to get every part. What you got was yeah. he was the victim. Tupac the victim, and that's what we really wanted to portray here. He was the victim of a rape, of a rape case. He was the victim of an of a East Coast, West Coast beef. He was a victim because Nigel was an asshole and a rapist mm-hmm. and all this. So they, they portrayed him as a victim and as an angel in, in, in those accounts. Yeah, there, and there, that's what there I wasn't, because, there because wasn't, the main narrative of Tupac has always been He's the good guy and the bad guy. Yeah. You know, he he is the angel and the thug. He's the thug angel. They gave us too much of the angel and none of the thug. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and remember, th- really thug matters. thug life by him is defined as if thug life isn't isn't what it means in the dictionary. It's not what thug means. Thug life means the underdog. You know, mm-hmm. that's what it is to him. You know, he said it's yeah. the underdog. It's not what's in the dictionary. It's not being a criminal. It's not that. So I mean that I mean you know dude you 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 got to do your thug life studies you know because it's it's not that that's not the the image of Tupac I think a lot of it is portrayed in how you perceive him I think how you perceive Pac I think is I think is the interesting part of this whole conversation because because it's almost like you looked at him as this hyper this this mythic figure this mythic <laughs> figure that was like. I, I, I don't know, I, I can't really describe it, but that in and of itself sort of explains it because that, that wasn't really what he tried to get across. Obviously, he had his, you know, he had his ignorant moments where it just dis- doesn't make any sense. And again, they gave you that small little scene when he gave that quotable, which I feel is the biggest defense to the, to the, uh, the directors use that as the biggest defense. 
they use that quote that he has, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't know that I tried to find it, but I couldn't find it. It had something to do with with the questioning. You're a walking contradiction. They literally use those words, which yeah, I think was yeah. kind of cringeworthy because that's what everybody always says about he's a walking contradiction. So, but so, so they, they could said, have used it in the film if they're gonna bring it up. Wait, wait. You know but what I mean? so so they they said you're a walking contradiction because you talk about that and you do this, and then Pac said. In order, and this is a this is a quote from him. He said, "In order to change people's lives, you have to enter their worlds to pull them back out." It was something like that, and I feel that that's what the writers of the film, that's what they intended as a defense. The 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 worst thing about this movie, I think, probably for you, the worst thing about that everything that you wanted, how you wanted him to be questioned for the things that he does. I felt that they addressed everything that you wanted them to address. They just didn't delve into anything they didn't have the balls to go into yeah. it because there were going to be inconsistencies on on the way they just gave you quotables and as a matter of fact at the end of that interaction when he was questioning him didn't tupac sort of charm him and he sort of just laughed and said oh Pac, you're you're great why, why did i even why did i question you you're, you're the fucking best because he well, told him every brother ain't a brother or something like that <laughs> yeah well going into what you said uh like uh, i mean uh, what you asked like were my favorite parts my favorite parts of the movie were the first part of the movie where we see yeah. him growing up, where we see the ideas, where we see the things that he's telling us, uh, the things that he's telling the, ca- uh, the director and the cameraman, you know, the things that he's uh, putting out there. Um, what I hated is that there was no payback for it. There was no manifestation mm-hmm. of those ideas. That's what I didn't like. Yeah. And I hated it even more because they were setting it up. If they didn't try to set it up at all, and if this was just, hey, here's just Tupac's life. Yeah. Like, that's fine. But the fact that it felt like they were trying to uh, front load us with all this information to be paid off, and then it kind of doesn't, because by the end, it's just, well, we just got to tell you everything that happened. That's where it, where it felt like it failed for me. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, never mind. Forget it. I just want, I want to point this out before anyone in the comment section does. They probably already have. You said something earlier today, and you were like, his life in 1989 and his life in 1997 and i was just randomly thinking about that i was like i don't think he was alive by 1997 oh you're right, you're right. <laughs> i just want to point oh, that out there's gonna be some the asshole oh please <laughs> yeah you know someone's going there's to. always one guy you're right there was always one. Oh, <laughs> duh, duh, duh. oh actually he was, uh, you know there is yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. you're right you're right there, there always is that one guy there's that one guy but you know wow. what? If they, if they didn't bother to care chronologically about the Hail Mary movie, then when I'm reviewing the movie, I'm gonna not <laughs> chronologically give a shit about what years he was alive. So, how yeah. about D? Catch so, me what, what's like. your what's your final thoughts? Final thoughts on the movie is it's complicated to make a Tupac movie. It is a heavy load. It is something that's going to be attempted again in the future. John Singleton said that maybe in the future he was the first director that signed on for this. Um, and then eventually him and LT Hutton had, you know, the creative differences because apparently, you know, he wanted Tupac to be like to talk to a severed head and to he was raping somebody at the beginning of the film. It probably would have been the film that you would like, as a matter of fact, what? He, was talk- he was raping people while talking to severed heads. What the fuck's going on? But did you did you hear about that? <laughs> no. Yeah. Apparently, apparently uh, LT Hutton had told the Breakfast Club that they didn't want to make the movie with him because what John Singleton had planned, the very first scene was going to be Pac. Um, ha- trying to have sex with two white women and he throws them out of the hotel room afterwards and then he says, go tell your father you just got fucked by a nigga. And then end scene and then the movie starts. That was going to be how the movie was, was going to start. And then at one point he had him talking to Southern Head. Yeah. So at the very Ooh. least, that's that's a weird way to start a movie, but at the very least, you know he was going to be questioned. It was going to be, you know... It, you know. <laughs> John Singleton's directing style has changed over the years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so, <laughs> so what I want to say is, is that this is going to be attempted again in the future. Somebody will get it right eventually. They'll get it right eventually. And if they do it in, in movie form again, it's going to have to be a longer film. I would sit for three hours and watch a Tupac movie. I sat and watched uh, Malcolm X was what? Three, four hours? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would uh, sit I there. Would, it's, I like the idea of the Netflix uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. thing. That's a lot better. Uh, I, uh, one of my favorite biopics that I ever saw was the Jacksons family, the American dream. Yeah. I felt like they let us know who that family was. Uh, I didn't like the way they ended it because the way they ended it was like, and then he made Thriller and nothing bad ever happened to Michael Jackson ever again. (laughs) 
<laughs> but, you know, I understand. They got to end it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. But up to that point, it really felt like we got their life. And I feel like a lot of biopics don't really give us that. Because you have to condense 25 fucking years or so into two and a half hours. It's not easy. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, if they gave us like a mini series or something like that, they throw that on Netflix, I would watch the shit out of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I feel like just here... They just didn't have enough time. Um, they didn't commit to didn't, anything. They didn't commit yeah. to anything. Didn't have enough budget, probably. Yeah. <laughs> you can kind of feel it at the end. <laughs> yeah, towards the end, it's like they, everything was filmed in the same room. That sort of felt, yeah. that sort of felt like. Death row offices, all, all that stuff. They just they just bought the red lighting. This was right, like the red, red lights. Lighting everywhere. Yeah, it was kind of goofy. Yeah. But, well, that's our review. Uh... If you liked what you heard, if you liked what you saw, uh, then you can comment and be like, hey, I liked it, or you guys are wrong, and here's my uh, dissertation on why. Uh, <laughs> but I guess like, comment, subscribe, that's the thing that people say nowadays. So, uh, and subscribe so, to my channel, it'll be in the description yeah, below. Yeah. Dude, due respect, he's got great videos. Uh, check him out. Yeah, they're, they're a, okay. They're, they're kind of shitty. It's, but th- go, go ahead anyway. <laughs> Just go ahead. Anyway. I like the I like uh, the, the recent one you did. On, oh fuck it. Well, go to his videos <laughs> and check him out. You'll see. Uh, but yeah. So uh, at the end of this video, me didn't really enjoy it. First couple of minutes was okay. Uh, your views was that started with poor casting and just. What the the cherry on the Sunday was poor storytelling. So it was just the formula for a terrible movie, the perfect formula. So that was our review of All Eyes on Me. If you want to see more, let us know. But until then, I'm Rap Critic, and I'm Do Respect, and we'll catch you later.